Michael Wright as he comes to minister God's word to us tonight. Appreciate it. All right. Glad you're here. We made it. Thank you, Pastor, once again for the invitation. I uh, appreciate the church, those in this church who came, those who visiting. You made, uh, made a drive. Got to go back tonight or maybe even in the morning. But thanks for being here. And uh, we're glad you're in church. I just need to also mention, as we're turning in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, I need to mention that this afternoon um, we played pickleball. If you don't know what that is, well, that's all right. You'll, you'll find out someday. But uh, the guys that I played with, they let me win so much that I need to uh, say thank you. They were very gracious uh, and humbling themselves before me, allowing me to slay them. And so I just want to say thank you to those guys. I don't want to say who it was. I don't want to let their names be known. But they might be in the back area of the church. (laughs) We had a good time. All right. Matthew chapter 16. Let's get uh, to the word of God. I'm going to show you a picture uh, in just a moment. It's a man named Joaquin Guzman. That was fast. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Put him up there. Uh, You might know him as El Chapo. Uh, This is the picture of his arrest. Before his arrest, in 2014, he was the most powerful drug lord. He had become famous by living with a $7 million bounty on his head. That's, That's significant. If no one that knows you will give you up for $7 million, that's either you have some great friends or people fear you. Uh, He also was famous for several prison escapes. He was worth over a billion dollars. He's a billionaire. He's ranked more powerful than the presidents of France and Venezuela In 2013, Chicago Crime Commission listed him as public enemy number one. He is the first to have that title since Al Capone in the 1920s. He's a famous criminal and he's got lots of power. But in the picture you're looking at, that's not what you see. What you see is a slightly overweight, humiliated, No power. A seized man. I love this picture because of the hand on his neck. Like we are, we are now in charge of you. This is right after he was uh, arrested. He was caught. They're transporting him. Ultimately, he went to the U.S. and he's still here in the U.S. He asked recently his attorney requested that he can have earplugs. They said no. He asked if he can get out one hour a week to get some sunlight, and he said no. He's lost all power. And what my point in showing you this is, is I want you to see something here, is he was arrested because he was a violator of the law. That people had to rise up, authorities had to rise up, recognize him and say, your power and your dominion is going to end. We are subduing you. We are taking you in like an animal. We are taking all your power from you. You cannot be in charge any longer. They took his dominion from him. Didn't matter how much power he had. He's more powerful than the president of France. Who cares? We're going to take his dominion. And that is a great picture of, because the Bible tells us that we have an enemy. He has power. He has strength. He can do things in the earth. And though our enemy Satan is powerful, we have a God-given authority that we can take dominion over him. He does not have to keep ruling. There are people here tonight, 
You are struggling. Your mind battles, your physical body, your relationships. There are things at work. You feel like you're under assault. The devil has power, yes, but you have the authority of Jesus Christ. You can subdue the enemy and have dominion. Our scripture that we're going to read in Matthew 16, Jesus is taking his disciples on a field trip. And he's going to teach them a lesson about spiritual warfare. And he promises believers that no matter what the devil plans against you, you can have dominion in this fight. You're not just going to win at the end. It's not just, I'll make heaven and then I'll be happy. In this fight, you can have dominion in this life. I want to preach the, a sermon I've called, The Power to Bind and Lose. Out of Matthew chapter 16, we're going to pick it up in verse 13. It says, Then when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So the disciples answered, Some say John the Baptist. Some Elijah and others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. This is verse 18. And I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The power to bind and loose. So let's begin and talk about spiritual warfare. Because in the story that we just read, Jesus takes his disciples to a place that the scripture says Caesarea Philippi is the name. And we need to understand what that means. It's 25 miles north of Galilee. Now, if you've read the Bible, you've read these names, you've read Cana, Nazareth, Capernaum, Tiberias. These are cities around the, the Sea of Galilee. This is where much of Jesus' early ministry, he would travel down to Jerusalem from time to time on journeys for festivals or feasts. He would go there and there's some things, a lot of the book of John has his interactions of his time in Jerusalem. But most of his miracles, the healings, all this stuff was done in this region around the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi is not around Galilee. It is 25 miles away by foot. That's almost a marathon. It's a far distance. There were lots of things that Jesus taught his disciples around the Sea of Galilee. All kinds of lessons, the, the famous Sermon on the Mount in that area. All these things, Jesus taught so many lessons to his disciples in this region, but for some reason, the lesson he wanted to teach now, he says, I can't teach you here. We need to travel. And they go to a place 25 miles away to this area. And the question we have to ask is why? Why did Jesus take all these men and take them up to this area? What was in Caesarea Philippi? Let me show you a picture. This is a current day picture of Caesarea Philippi. Any of you ever been to Israel? Any of you been there? Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. You, you've been there, right? You've been there? Yeah, yeah. I, I went there when I was 16. I got lucky and uh, I got to go with my dad. And so we've been here. This is what it looks like modern day. It's a cave. There used to be water that would come out of that. But it, what it was is it was begun by Alexander the Great in the 3rd century B.C. He came through, and when he conquered the area, this giant cave where water would flow out, he set up a, 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 an altar to the Greek god Pan. Now, if you have ever seen the goat god, uh, the pentagram, the upside-down star, right? It's got the... the the goat's face in the, the, that's the Greek god Pan. He's a goat god. Alexander the Great set up worship to the Greek god Pan in this area. It was a place of demon worship. They would make sacrifices. It was a place of witchcraft and idolatry. They would do rituals there. The Romans came through. They conquered the area and they would then set up not just idols and things for Pan. They set up 
their gods. And so go to the next picture. This is uh, kind of what it would have looked like in the day where uh, when Jesus was, or J Jesus was there. There was the, the temple. Of course, you have the court of Pan there in the middle. And then you have to Augustus, to Zeus. This was the Roman influence. And so for hundreds of years, from Alexander to Jesus, this is a place of demon worship. It's a place where rituals are done and witchcraft is taking place. And Jesus says to his disciples, I want to take you there and teach you some lessons. They travel to this location because Jesus knew we are not going to stay in safe places. If you're going to do the Christian life, if you're going to live this life for God, you're not going to stay in safe places. You're going to have to confront some enemies. And he takes his disciples to a place where all these spiritual things are happening. All kinds of demon worship and witchcraft. And he says, this is what I want you to see. And there are people right now that need to understand something about the world we live in. Whether you acknowledge it or not, we live in a spiritual world. But the things you go through, they're not just physical. You cannot be ignorant of the, the spiritual battles going on in life. So let me just take a moment here. I'm gonna, I want to walk through some of these things because what happens for many people is they begin to live life and they think, because Satan wants to stay hidden, what I'm going through right now is something everybody goes through. Had a guy who used to, he would wake up every morning, he would throw up every morning. He went to the doctor about something else, uh, you know, some other sickness, and the doctor's asking him about things, and he said, well, you know, I mentioned, yeah, and, and, you know, vomiting every morning, and the doctor goes, wait, what? He said, yeah, I, I vomit every morning. And the doctor goes, how long's that been for? He said, years, doesn't everybody? In his mind, it was like, yeah, that's normal. And what happens is people can do things thinking this is something everything, everybody goes through. We had a group, a, a family who got saved in, in California, uh, Southern California, were pastoring down there for a few years. And we would watch the kids in the afternoon, uh, Sunday afternoons from time to time. And so the kids mentioned to us one day, they said, uh, this guy comes in our house and he bothers us. And, and so I worked with the mom and, and, you know, that's how they came into church. And so kind of like, wait, what? This, somebody comes in your house when you're, is your mom there? So they said, yeah, sometimes. And we're like, who is it? And they go, we don't know him. He just comes in and bothers us. And I was like, do you tell him to leave? And they said, well, we tell him to, but he doesn't leave. And so I go to the mom, you know, I'm talking to her about it. And I said, your kids mentioned this. And she said, yeah, it's like a spirit shows up and scares us and won't leave. And, and they said it like it was, doesn't everybody get that? Doesn't, doesn't, don't spirits show up in everybody's house and torment them? And I'm like, no, I, no, I, I don't have that in my house. That's not normal. But the enemy does things and makes you feel like this is normal or you're the problem. So let's look at a couple things the enemy does. Number one, he will make us feel oppressed, despair, a loss of hope beyond just the highs and lows of life, but it's this depression that sets in uh, into your spirit. And then he says, he'll kick you in the guts and then say, what kind of real Christian has pain in their guts? He's the problem, but we feel like it's us. Number two is there is sickness, Again, I know germs exist. I know you can get a cold and it's not the devil. I understand that. But there are sicknesses. They're unnatural. It's like every, like it could be a timing thing. Every time you're on your way to church, you start getting headaches. Every time there's a revival coming up, the week before, everybody gets sick and nobody makes revival. Conference, all these things. It can be, it goes round and round in the family. It's dad, it's mom, it's son, it's daughter, it's the dog, it's the cat, it's the gerbil, it's back to dad, to mom. And it just goes round and round and round. It never leaves. That's spiritual. That's demonic. That is an assault. Number three is there can be supernatural conflict in your home. An atmosphere of, it's like everything's tense. There's, it's there, fighting over nothing. Again, if you're a jerk, 
that's not the devil's fault that you're fighting. Okay. But I'm talking about like it's not normally this way. But in the house, now it's like there's this vexing spirit. You go home and you fight about nothing. That's demonic. It can come out manifest in resistance to fruitfulness. The enemy is always after the fruit. And ultimately, the Bible teaches us that barrenness is not to be accepted. It's a curse. Number five is there's resistance in finances. Strange things that consume money. Every time you get savings, something breaks, something blows up, medical bill shows up, something happens and consumes. Your money is always being consumed. That's demonic. And then finally is unnatural problems in your sleep. Is either you cannot sleep or you wake up all through the night or you wake up and you feel something demonic. You're, there's you wake up in panic or you sleep, you wake up in the morning and you are never refreshed. You never feel rested. Listen, that's an assault. That's demonic. You're under spiritual warfare. Let's talk secondly then about the correct focus. Because Jesus brings them to this area called Caesarea Philippi, and he doesn't ask them, do you know how powerful the Greek god Pan is? You know, the Romans worships Zeus. Zeus throws lightning. He doesn't ask them. He says this. You see everything happening here? Now who am I? And this is what Jesus wants them to see. Matthew 16, 13. So he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? That when they are surrounded by witchcraft and seances and demon gods, Jesus asked the question, who am I? Because when you're in spiritual battle, um, Jesus is not concerned about how big the devil is or how much power demons have uh, or how many demons there are per square inch or how many witchcraft idols uh, there are set up throughout your city. Jesus isn't concerned. What he asks is, how do you see me? Who am I to you? Who am I in your life? Um, that is what Jesus is concerned. And the way he compels the disciples uh, to acknowledge who he is was, I want you to say it. It's not just an expression of your devotion. He didn't tell the disciples, okay, if you believe I'm Jesus, go down there and knock over that, that idol. Go make people mad by riling up this, this crowd. He says, I want you to speak it. I want you to say it. Who do they say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because the way we put our focus on who Jesus is, and not on our circumstances, not on how sick, not this is the worst the doctor's ever seen, they told me uh, it's as bad as it gets. Not any of that. Who is Jesus? In our text, verse 15, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Jesus wanted their words to reflect what was in their heart. When you are in spiritual warfare, when you're fighting battles against the enemy, uh, we can get caught talking about the devil, talking about people, they're the problem, blame ourselves. I had a pastor's wife tell me we're, you know, working through and, and she said, if it wasn't for me, my husband could have revival here. She's, they're under assault and she's thinking, I'm the problem. She's a great woman of God, but, but in her mind, the devil had, it had, it, it was like, I'm the problem. And we get caught talking about everything else except for, you know what? I believe God. I believe he's more powerful when in the middle of a battle, you have to correct your focus. Stop looking at the big devil and look at who Jesus is. So let's close and talk thirdly about dominion because there are two points of dominion that Jesus mentions in our text. Number one is Jesus says, 
God's church is going to be built and hell cannot stop that. It doesn't matter how powerful the devil is, God will build his church. In verse 18, and I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What Jesus is saying is God places the dominion of his church on people that have revelation of who he is. That God's dominion, those who are going to impact the world, those who are going to go into cities and nations and impact those cities and nations for the gospel, the dominion of God is going to ride on people who know who he is, that have a revelation of him. And he uses this phrase, the gates of hell, because gates were a place where kings and judges would govern from. This is throughout the Bible, 2 Samuel 18, 24. David sat between the gates. He was there when he was waiting for battle strategies. Gates were a place where you would rule. It was how you would plan to gain more territory. In Judges 16, verse 3, Samson goes and lifts the gates of the city and carries them. It wasn't a new workout regimen. Like, what can I do to lift the weights today? I say, no, oh, these gates will do. He was making a statement about dominion. I am taking this city. And he took the gates. Absalom won the hearts of the people. Uh, he took over the kingdom uh, by winning them in the gates of the city. And what Jesus says, by the gates of hell shall not prevail, is he is saying that ruling powers, principalities, strategies of the enemy that work against your life, that work against your church, what the enemy want, wants to do against your congregation in the city where you labor, it's not going to prevail. It's not going to work. That God can overcome those things. Numbers 23, 23, there is no magic charm, no witchcraft that can be used against the people of God. Now it will be said, look what God has done that there is no power of hell that can overcome God. You know, if you read Revelation 19, it's about it, it, like Armageddon, right? We kind of know this term, this word Armageddon. And uh, usually it's, it's in our minds, it can conjure these ideas of this is the final battle. Like this is, this is the bloody mess where the whole thing goes down at the end of time. But you know what the battle of Armageddon actually is? I don't know why we call it a battle. It's not even a fight. Here's what happens in the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. Is the devil finally has everything he wants. Everyone that's left on earth has submitted to him. They are worshiping him. They're taking the mark. And if they're not taking the mark, they're dead. He has conjured. He has the, the beast, the false prophet, all these things. He's now incarnate. He's in... The living in the earth, and he has full power. Everything finally belongs to him. The thing he's wanted since the garden, he finally has it. And now he comes with all the nations of the earth. The Bible says all rulers and kingdoms with him. And now he comes and he comes to Israel. And he's going to fight. And then the Bible says, Jesus shows up and that's the end of the battle. Jesus just shows up. There's no wrestling match. There's, there's no, you know, Jesus doesn't even have, he doesn't even get off his horse. The Bible says, and he defeated him with the sword from his mouth. Jesus shows up and says, take him and throw him in the pit. And that's it. There's no battle of Armageddon. It's everything the devil has, and then Jesus shows up, and everything's defeated. That's how much power Jesus has. It's not two heavyweights going at it, you know, and the devil is as good, or he is as bad as God is good, and they're fighting each other. That's, that's barbarian religion. That's mythology. It's like Hades and Zeus and all that. That's not the God we serve. He has all power. That's why Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail. God's going to build his church. And the second dominion we see that Jesus mentions is that it is our God-given authority to take territory from hell. 
Verse 19, Jesus says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What keys were is where keys were the authority. It was access. Right now, you probably have keys in your pocket, your purse. You, you have keys there, keys to your car, keys to your house, maybe a business. You're not driving that car right now. You're not in that house right now. You just have the access to do that if you want. You have the opportunity. You have authority. You have the keys. You could go to your house. You could go to your car. But you're not doing that right now. You just have authority to do that. You have the right to do that. The difference between authority and dominion is dominion is when you take those keys and you use them. You put that in the ignition of the car. You put it in the keyhole at your house and you open those doors. So you go and now you are living in that. Authority is just the access, but dominion is when you actually do it. See, authority is the right. Dominion is something you have to take yourself. Jesus purchased our authority. But then he says, now I'm giving the keys to you, though. And you have to go do something. You have to take the authority of the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and change the situations of your life with that. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 3, Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given unto you. It's not yours till you go. It's not enough that you just stay in your safe place. Joshua, you're going to have to go into this land. You're going to have to go into these places. Wherever your feet go, that's where I've given you. It's not enough to stay in one place and go, well, I sure hope everything changes. No, you have to go take dominion. Some people, uh, they make the mistake of, I'm waiting for God to give me dominion. That's not how it works. He gives you authority. And then he says, now whatever you bind on earth, whatever you lose, you have authority to take dominion. In your home, you can bind the spirit of fear. In your life, you bind the spirit of depression, of sickness, of barrenness. In your church, you rebuke the devourer. That's you. you. Your job is to do that. You can lose joy and peace, fruitfulness, wealth, prosperity. Pastor Nigel Brown just preached in the conference about this idea. That's your sphere. That's, that you influence that area. God's given you the authority, but you have to take the dominion. This is why we go outreach. We go into neighborhoods, into places, uh, and we take dominion. Pastor Mitchell has said, uh, evangelism is wearing down your city's resistance to the gospel. You go again and again because you're taking dominion. That's why we street preach. That's why we do things because we are taking dominion. And as we go, um, entire homes, entire families, workplaces can change. Your school can change. The city you're in, a nation, a continent can change based on your dominion. That's why when we send a couple into a nation, right? It'd be, it'd be a nation of 10 million people. And we say things like, we're taking that nation. There's two people from our fellowship. We're like, yeah, it's ours. Because they go and they're going to start taking dominion. They're going to go live first. They're going to get a house. And in that house, they're going to establish dominion there. They're, they're Christians. They're going to pray in that house. They're going to worship God in that house. They're going to start having some people over to that house. They're going to witness to those people. Those people are going to get saved. After a little bit, they're going to find a building. They're going to establish dominion in that building. They're going to have prayer in that building. They're going to have services. And from there, they're going to begin to outreach. And they're going to begin to spread. They're taking dominion. We don't just stay in our comfortable churches in America and go, those places, yes, yes, God, save all those people out there. We go and we take dominion from the enemy. Luke 10, 17, then the 70 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What happened there? Jesus ordained them. He gave them authority. And then he sent them out. And based on whatever they were going to do is what Jesus was going to see happen. He sent them out. They come back and they say, we prayed for the sick. We cast out demons. They did it, not Jesus. Jesus just gave them the right to. And when they came back, individuals went out. But Jesus said, I saw regions fall. The power of hell in a region, it crumbled. Satan fell because individual people went out and took dominion. Let's close with a story. I was pastoring in the islands. I was there for seven and a half years. And so we had uh, a wild time. A lot of stuff happened. It was a place. It's a place that a lot of demonic stuff happens. Um, The islands are pretty wild. We have, you know, they bury the dead on their property so they can talk to them for the rest of their lives uh, and until they're buried and then they'll talk to their relatives and, and, uh, and so they leave food out. They, everybody in our church would talk to their dead relatives and so it's not really their dead relatives, it's demons. I had a lady come to me one time and she said, am I really talking to my uncle? And I was like, no. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> Thank you for asking. But, but it's, very, it's, it's full of witchcraft and all kinds of stuff and and so we had this couple in our church, this uh, Filipino couple, Jerry and Carmela. And so Jerry calls me one day. He was working uh, a job. He calls me from work, and he says, Pastor, I just talked to my father on the phone, but my father's been dead for two years. And he was obviously scared. I was obviously confused. And I was trying to get what he was talking about. And he and I'm like, who was it? It was like an impersonator? Is it a joke? Is somebody hire this? What happened? And he said he was talking to me, telling me, you know, I'm your father. I want you to and and so I couldn't get the story. And I just knew there was something demonic happening. So I told him, I said, listen, when you're off work, uh, get your wife and come over to my house. And we'll pray. I'll pray for your family. It was back in the Philippines in the uh, province outside of Manila there where they were farmers. And so they come to the house and I start, I get the story. And this is what had happened. Back in this guy's uh, uh, home, uh, Jerry's home, his family were farmers. Their neighbors, they had conflict with them. The neighbors wanted Jerry's family's land. And they wouldn't make a deal. They wouldn't sell it to them. And so the neighbors hired a witch doctor. This guy shows up, he's got, as you would uh, think in the movies, he's got a black robe, he's got his incantation book, and he comes and he stands on the line of their property and he begins speaking curses. And he sends a demon into Jerry's brother, Jesse. Jesse becomes demon-possessed. Now, I just want to say right here, uh, the doors were already opened in this family. You don't have to be scared if somebody shows up and they've got a black gown and you're like, ah! He's going to send a demon in me. If you're a Christian, you don't have any fear of that. You're fine. You're protected by Jesus. But there were already things at work here. Jerry, uh, his brother Jesse, gets demon-possessed. When this happens, his tongue grows out of his mouth, and he starts speaking in the voice of the dead father. There were about 25 family members that live in this area, this farm area, about 10 to 12 of them have immediate manifestations that are demonic. Some of them tumors uh, grew into their sides. Others, their fingers grew out longer than the others. And so they've got video of this guy with his tongue out speaking in, in the voice of the dead father. He tells the family that he begins to command them, give this land uh, to them or or 100,000 pesos or whatever the amount was. Pay them this money uh, or Jesse is going to be dead tomorrow. He calls Jerry. This is the phone call. And he's telling him, you need to pay this family. You need to give them this land or I'm going to be dead. Your your brother's going to be dead, on and on. After he manifests for a while, he's speaking to the family. He goes into a coma. They carry Jesse into the house. And this is when I get the phone call. (laughs) Like I'm supposed to know what to do, you know. God's man of faith and power. Fix this. And so honestly, I will be totally honest, I, have, I had no clue what to do. I was, I, was, I was scared. I was nervous. 
but I know the Bible. And the Bible says we can take dominion. And so what we did is when they came to my house, and I had told them, gather up, you know, the family. So there's about 20, 25 members of the family in this house around Jesse who's unconscious. He's laying in the bed. And we're in our house in Samoa, in the islands, thousands of miles away. We're on the phone. And so we get it on speakerphone. They're speaking in Tagalog. So I'm, I'm telling the wife, she's then translating on the speakerphone there, and they're repeating. So here's what happens. I say, I'm going to lead you all in a prayer of repentance. They all, 25, pray the prayer. They get saved. And I said, all right, now the most spiritual one there, go lay your hand on Jesse. And, of course, the mom, right? The mom's always the most spiritual. So she goes and she lays her hand. And I want you to catch something here because there's no faking this. There's no like evangelist, TV evangelist, like I said in Jesus' name, you know. It's translated like telephone line. I'm going to say it. She's going to repeat it in Tagalog. Then it's going to go to the Philippines. They're going to repeat it on the speakerphone and pray there. It's a brand new Christian. There's no charismatic acting here. It's just dominion. Taking God at his word. I led them in a prayer. I said, we cast out that devil, led her in a prayer of, I rebuke you, command this spirit to leave. In Jesus' name, amen. And everything breaks loose. There's screaming. There's, you know, it's a, and so we have no idea what's happening. All we're hearing is yelling and screaming. And we're thinking, uh, is he eating people? Like he's tearing their heads off. What's happening? And what had happened is that demon left. Jesse wakes up and he is, he's obviously uh, scared. He's breathing heavy. He's losing it. And so I began to ask, I want you to test. Everyone test yourself. They began to check. The tumors that had showed up were instantly gone. Uh, fingers had gone back to normal. Every influence that demon had in the family had disappeared. We took dominion. And then like a good pastor, I took advantage of the situation. I was like, well, now here's what you need to do. You need to get rid of all your idols. I want you to clean house tonight. And so I'm on the phone. So they start tearing down religious pictures of Jesus, crucifix, Mary in the bathtub. They get, every, they get everything out. And then I called the leader in the Philippines, uh, Alberto de Cepeda. And I told him, I said, I told him the story. This is, this is what happened. The, the family gave him where the area was. And uh, so they send a guy, a disciple out to kind of meet with this family. I said, there's like 25 of them there. They go out. They meet this family. And uh, it's going so well, they start having Saturday services. On these Saturday services, people are coming in, getting saved. At the next uh, conference, uh, they sent a worker. There's a church there today uh, because we took dominion. That's what the Bible says. The gates of hell will not prevail. What the devil, the, my favorite part about that story is what the devil intended as a curse turned into a church. The devil wanted to torment. He wanted to oppress people. But when God's people say, no, I forbid it. I bind that. Instead, I loose deliverance and power and salvation. There's a church there now. Because God will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. I want to give an invitation before we move on in the service. We're going to do other things. I'm going to pray for the sick. I'm going to pray for deliverance. I'm going to pray for several things. But before we do that, I want to give an invitation for people here that you're not living for God right now. I don't know what the condition of your soul is. But between you and God, you know. And if you're living in sin, the Bible says that sin is taking you somewhere Ultimately, sin is going to take you to hell. And if you die in your sin, if you die continuing to live, uh, clinging to your sin, refusing to repent and give your life to Jesus and surrender to Him, if you die in that condition and God's judgment falls on your sin, it's going to fall on you. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that that judgment won't happen on you. 
What Jesus Christ did by dying on the cross is he took punishment in your place. That instead of you standing before God and God judging your sin, Jesus said, I will die. I will bear the punishment for them. That's why it wasn't enough for Jesus just to die one day. He had to be punished. He had to be crucified. He had to be whipped and beaten because that was what God thinks of sin. That was God's judgment on sin being poured out on Jesus. It wasn't just, well, he stopped breathing. He died for our sins. He was punished for our sins. And when we repent, when we come to a decision and humble ourselves and say, God, I have been living in sin, but I don't want to keep living this way. I want to repent. I want to pray. By doing that, what we do is we allow the blood of Jesus to wash our sin away. And we don't have to bear the, bear the punishment now. Jesus did it already. When you die and you stand before God, it's not your sin that, Jesus, that God sees. It's the blood. It's washed you clean. And if you want that tonight, you want forgiveness, you want to pray. By lifting your hand, you're saying, yes, I want to pray. I want to believe God to change my life. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand right now. While heads are bowed, yes, that's me. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for that hand. Those hands there. How many others? Get right with God. I appreciate your honesty. How many others? Lift up your hand. Say, that's me. That's what I need. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I don't want to live in my sin anymore. I want Jesus to forgive me. Maybe you're a backslider. You lived for God at one time in the past, but you've gone back into sin. And what the devil would do is do everything he can to bring a shame on that, a condemnation that makes you believe God won't have you back. God is so angry and frustrated. Can I tell you something? I know what the Bible says about backsliders. What it says is God is committed to saving you. He will fight to save you. And he brought you here tonight for that reason. If you're backslidden, you don't have to keep living under condemnation. It's time to just say, God, I'm sorry. I'm done with this. Come back to Jesus. Repent of your sin. Backslider, lift up your hand. That's you. Time to get it right. This is the night you need to do it. Don't leave under condemnation. Thank you. God bless you, sir. How many others? Don't leave the same. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Get right with God tonight. Lift up your hand. Join these. Praise God. I want to change the call then. As our heads are bowed, I'm challenging you. I, as I preach, there were things I mentioned specifically. Things about oppression, depression, loss of hope. Maybe it's sickness or conflict in your home resistance and fruitfulness in, in finances and sleep problems these things and perhaps as I mentioned these things God was showing you that's not normal is the Holy Spirit was speaking to you that showing you that this is not what other people are going through you're under assault and I'm challenging you if you are in that you're living under that it's time to take dominion to say, I'm not going to keep letting this happen in my life. I'm what the, This is not normal. This is demonic. And I'm not going to let it keep going on. I'm going to stop it. I'm taking dominion by the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be in my place. I'm changing the situation. We're going to all open the altar in a moment. Just before we do, if you lifted your hand for salvation, I want you to come. Look at me here. You meant it? You meant it there? I'm, I believe you did. I believe you did. I want you to come. I want somebody to pray with him. Yeah. I want a girl to pray with her, a woman to pray with her, a man to pray with this man. God bless you guys. Appreciate your honesty. God bless you. Appreciate you, Alex. God bless you. You can kneel down right here. This woman behind you is going to pray with you. Alex, he's going to pray with you. The rest of us, let's find our place at the altar. You come. You fill in the space here. We're all going to lay hold of God as we sing a song of worship. Let's spend time speaking to God about the issues of life. Help us, Jesus. Help us. Help us tonight.
want you to stand right where you are. Just stand for a moment. I want to lead you in a prayer. As we stand to our feet, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to pray that God give you dominion. I want you to speak these words out loud. I want you to say, Jesus, I believe you. You are who you say you are. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that you are Lord. You see my situation. I thank you for the authority to change it. And right now, I need strength to take dominion in my life. Put into my soul a boldness and a courage that comes from the Spirit of God. That I need to change this. I bind the work of hell. Works of darkness will not continue. I will not be tormented any longer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's thank God and give Him praise. God, I take dominion. I speak deliverance. Works of hell will not continue. Lord, you're going to overcome strategies. By the authority of Jesus Christ, I take dominion. Problems in rest and in sleep, I bind the work of hell. Financial things that are being consumed. God, I speak favor. People oppressed under the work of darkness, I speak deliverance. Praise God. We serve a good God. Can you say amen? amen. He is good to us. He wants to help us. Amen. I want to pray for a few things here. I mentioned last night, I want to pray for several areas of sickness. And so if, um, if you're going to fall under any of these, I want you just to stay. Uh, in the front, if you're not one of these issues, you can be seated. Anybody you have breathing conditions, whether it's your lungs or sinuses, you're on an inhaler. Uh, some uh, uh, some people, many people had COVID. They have damage still done to their lungs from that. Um, any of those things, you have breathing trouble, I want to pray for you. Anyone with skin conditions, um, you have a rash, eczema, psoriasis, any kind of issue on your skin. Um, for you, I'm going to pray. Anybody that has digestion issues, acid reflux, IBS, uh, ulcers, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for anyone that has a blood disease, um, whether that's cancer, hepatitis, leukemia, STD, diabetes, uh, whatever it is. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for anyone you have an organ problem, heart, kidneys, liver, bladder, gallbladder, pancreas, spleen, some issue there. Uh, uh, either there's a disease or it's not functioning properly. I want to pray for those things. That's a long list. So if you need prayer for any of those things, I want you to stay. If you don't need prayer, you can go ahead and return to your seat. Um, I want to give you a couple testimonies. First of all, there was a, a man I prayed for in India. His nose had been crushed whenever he was uh, in, a, in a motorcycle accident. And had smashed so badly, they reconstructed the outside. But the inside, he had no nostrils. He couldn't breathe through his nose. No nostrils were there. And uh, he came for prayer because he had heard of a lot of uh, miracles that were happening in the revival services. So his friend brought him. He came. We prayed in a mass prayer, just like we're going to do right now. Just prayed for people in a mass prayer. And he, he got healed. His friend brought him and up for a testimony. We were asking for testimonies. And when his friend brought him, I told the guy, I said, I want you to breathe in through your nose. And just out of a command, he went and breathed in through nostrils that had been created. He looks at his friend, and his friend goes, your nose changed. That literally the shape of his nose had been recreated. God did a miracle. I love that story. I told my wife, my wife, she's got her own mocking spirit. I told my wife, and she goes, great, you could be the rhinoplastic surgery, plastic surgery, uh, uh, evangelist. You know, go around, put that on your flyer, you know, rhinoplasty work. And I said, babe, get out of here, man. She's a mocker. Had a guy who I prayed for. This uh, was a skin uh, condition miracle. He had eczema uh, on his hands, different issues there. When we prayed for him, instantly he's watching 
as his skin is healing. Uh, and he said, I'm watching. It's changing right now. By that night service, uh, he was completely healed of that. Then uh, had a girl in, um, uh, in a church who came. I, I think I mentioned this last night. She had PCOS, uh, hormonal disease. She couldn't have kids. And uh, she got prayed for. She got a doctor's report. She came back later on the revival that she had been healed of that. So I want to pray for all these things. I want to believe God for you. If you'll, if you'll move down here, just, again, my OCD is getting messed up. I need you guys to be all leveled out, you know, in one line. You guys, here you go. Come over on this side. Just give them, a, give them some space. Okay, so are any of you here that you would be able to tell right now if there was a miracle? I know a lot of these things where you have to get tested. It'd be, if it's an organ thing, a blood thing, you'd have to be tested. But anyone here, you'd be able to tell yet? Or you'd have to let us know later? Hi, Mom. Um, she's been having a lot of health issues um, with her heart. She had cholesterol. stroke. Okay. Um, having a lot of dizzy spells. She wasn't in from the day, but I stick with her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you came. Yeah. She needs it. Okay. We all do. We all do. Yes. So, um, Good. But you'll have to let us know. In there, something from severe accidents, like that. Like that. Okay. Yeah. Is she's in the nursery? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, uh, she's going to, she'll get her. We'll bring her here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. You would know. I had asthma uh, when I was growing up uh, for years. I couldn't run, couldn't do things, uh, and then I got healed. And when I got healed, it it broke. I was having an asthma attack. My mom prayed for me. She got so sick of it. She got, she prayed angry. She grabbed my body and was like, Ugh! like she was mad because she was so sick of dealing with it. But she cast it out. A spirit of fear, fear of rejection. She cast it out, and I got healed. I got totally, I, I played soccer for seven years after that. <laughs> I ran a marathon. I mean, I, you know, I got totally healed. God, God delivered me, so God can heal that. High blood pressure, okay. All right, she's coming. Acid, okay. Is it certain foods? You eat certain foods? Yeah, eat a piece of lettuce and I get it. Yeah, okay. All right. Not that anybody wants to eat lettuce. <laughs> All right. I want you to I want you to lay your hand. If, it, if there's a specific area in your body where the problem is, I want you to put your hand there. If there's a lot of things or if it's blood or a disease in your body, put your hand on your head. And we're going to pray together. I want to lead you in a prayer and say, Jesus. Say it out, say it out loud. Jesus, I take dominion. I cast out the spirit of this infirmity. I command sickness to leave. The blood of Jesus sets me free in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin to worship God. God, I pray, do a miracle in these lives. Touch their bodies. Loose him in Jesus' name. I command healing in her skin. God, touch her body. I bind witchcraft and words spoken against her. Heal her, God. Heal Alex right now. Touch his body. Do a miracle in them. God, I pray right now, touch them. Touch her, God. Do a miracle in these lives. Healing virtue to flow. Touch her, God, right now. Do a miracle. Healing virtue to flow. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Yeah, what'd they say? It won't bend. It won't bend. Yeah. Were you here last night? No. Oh, all right. Because we prayed for locked joints. Oh, yeah? Okay, what I want to do real quick, I want to pray for you, but before I do that, you'll have to let us know, okay? It's a lot of you, it's something you'll have to let us know. I want you to check her skin tonight, tomorrow, and just let us know if there's a change in that, okay? okay. And let us know, let us, let us see... See what's different, okay? I want to pray then next is I'll pray for you, and I want to pray for anyone who's in pain right now. Uh, you have pain, you, uh, you have back pain, you're in physical pain in your body, back, leg, head, shoulder issues, whatever. Uh, you have some kind of issue. I want you to come. You have pain right now? What's in your right foot? Okay. Emma? Paul, yeah, well, all right. Jesus can put you back together. 
pain in your, is it joint? And been to the doctor, they say anything? Or arthritis? Really? Okay, let's pray for that. Anyone else? Anyone else? You're in pain right now. Okay, uh, I just had I just prayed for a guy. This would have been a um, uh, little bit ago. I don't remember, but he had a finger that was locked like that, and it wouldn't open. We I didn't even pray for him. I, I prayed a mass prayer. He was over on the side. I was praying for another lady for uh, the same kind of issue, a locked joint, and he got healed over on the side, and he started yelling. He goes, it's open! And we're like, we didn't even pray for him. Uh, but yeah, God did a miracle for him. Anyways, God's allowed to do that, I guess. He can do whatever he wants. So I want to pray for you guys. And pray that the pain leaves right now. You believe God? That would be great. Wouldn't it be great if that worked? That would be nice. It would be great to have no pain, huh? How long has it, has it been hurting? Three weeks. Did you do anything to injure it or? Really? Okay, let's pray. I want you to stretch your hands towards these church. I want you to let's pray together. Let's believe God. I want you to say, I command healing virtue into my body right now. Loose them in Jesus' name. I command pain to go. I command this finger to function normally. Come out in Jesus' name. Um, loose him right now. God, I command healing um, to flow through her body in Jesus' name. Um, let's praise God, church. I want you to test. Try to open that. Loose him in Jesus' name. Is there any change yet? All right, keep going. Alex, let me ask something. If I ask you, who, is there anyone that has uh, hurt you? Would anyone come to mind? Anyone in the past? No one at all? No? And is there a change yet? Any difference in that? Not yet. Where's the pain at? How about? Yeah, no, I believe you. I believe you. Any difference there? You felt something move but where, what about the pain is it still there a little bit okay how about you any difference it doesn't hurt right now the... yeah really so you got healed last night of that lump praise God is that right okay praise God now here's what we're gonna do we're gonna pray one more time Alex you alright with that and also, I want to pray for, I mentioned, uh, I want you to lay your hands on it. We prayed last night, and it was like, well, it was a little better, but it wasn't totally healed. I want you just right where you are, I want you to put your hand on your body again and pray. Here's, I've told you, I told you some testimonies last night of the girl who got healed, her eye open, blind eye from birth. She was able to see. That was just on Monday. A uh, lady who had been deaf since, since uh, uh, in her ears, um, uh, had the hearing aid things. She was in her 60s. It was a birth defect. She took those off. She got healed. Many of those things came when we prayed the second time. The first time is because you take dominion. You don't just go, oh, well, I guess it didn't work. Is No, it's a fight. We're, we're taking dominion. So that's what we're going to do right now. Put your hand there. Put your hand on your foot. Right there. If, you, if we prayed for something, I want you to put your hand back where the pain is. I want you to say... Say, Jesus, I command by your authority pain to leave. The blood sets me free. Loose him right now. Let's worship God again. God, do a miracle. Touch his body. I command pain to go. What's the difference in that? Yeah? What's the difference there? Is there a change? I'm sorry, say it. Yeah, stand up. Put some put put some weight on it. Okay. So if you take off your shoe, you can test it. You can you can look at it. All right. I want you to go do that. I want you to go. I want you to go test it. Go go do that. You can go. Uh, yeah. 
All right, but is there any that it's different from when you came up? Same there. All right. Well, let's see what God does. I want to also want to pray for one final thing just before we go. You all can be seated because I don't want your legs to get too tired. What's different? What's changed? Yeah. And where's the pain at? Now I can see that. But so where's the pain though? Because that might go away over time. What, what was the evidence that it was hurting when you? Yeah. Anything changed? There's there's no pain, but there's numbness. Okay. Well, thank God there's no pain. Let's see what God can do about that numbness. All right. Thank God, church. Let's worship God. I want to pray for you. What was your name again? Greg? Ray. Greg's our right name too, I guess. But it's Ray. Is that right? And your name? Melinda. Ray, I was... Ray, yeah, Ray. I was praying about you today. And, uh, and, and what God, God... God wants me to tell you a couple things. And this is what it is. It's the, the picture that I can give you is like whenever you have kids that are growing up and they're becoming teenagers. When they're born and as they grow, all the parent sees is potential. And it's like, you look at your kids and it's all about what they can be. And it's full of life and hope. And then they become teenagers or young adults. And, and, and for some, they begin to get very disappointed because their kids aren't fulfilling. And it's like, why are you wasting your potential? I have teenagers, and sometimes it's it's like that. You're like, press, like you got so much potential. And what God wants me to tell you is when God sees you, He does not want you to waste your potential. Your Christianity has so much more in it. It's like you're holding, it's like you're holding something very powerful. But in it, if you will, if you will do it right, there is so much more in it. That if you will commit yourself, it's like, uh, you know, if you want to be a better athlete or you want to be better at, you know, you go get a degree, you go work the, you know, in the gym, you have to invest in it. And when you do that, you're going to get so much more out of it because in you is, is there's a ton of potential in you. But in your Christianity, God looks at you as your heavenly Father and goes, "Let's see it." Let's press in for it. I want to give you a scripture. 90, uh, Psalms 95, verse 7. The, 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 I want you to write that down. Or I want you to, you can, uh, what was your name? Melinda. That's what I was going to say. Or write it down or whatever and go read this later. It's Psalms 95, 7. What I want you to notice is the words, if you will hear. Is he said, there's, there's possibility he will be, Father, you'll you'll be all these things if you will hear is the word there because it's an if. Is all that potential is there if, if you'll press in for it, okay? I want to pray for you. Give me your hand. God, I pray for this young man. Make him the man of God that you've called him to be. Put into his soul, into his spirit um, the things. um, Draw out of him um, revelation. God, I pray He would fulfill destiny, the potential you have ordained. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for letting me pray for you. God bless you. Let's thank God, church. All right. I want you to stand because I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be done in just a minute, but I gotta do one more thing. I want you to take the next few moments. Give me about, give me about five more minutes, maybe less. There's a couple minutes here. Just let me do this. This this one thing to do. I want to do. I want you to listen to me. I want to pray first. I want to pray for men here that you want to be used in the gifts. That you want to be used. You want to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. You want to give words of knowledge and words of wisdom on outreach. You want to be you want to be at the outreach and you want to pray for people and you want to say your back hurts right now and just by God speaking it to you. 
You want to be used in speaking out in tongues in service and interpreting, uh, speaking for God. All these, the nine gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. That you want God to use you. You are a man. Maybe you're not a man yet. You can be a young, young boy. You are a male. And you want God to be, be using you in that way. You are going to be willing to step out and take some chances for God. I want you to just come. I want you to stand right here in the front. I want you to stand. Come out of your seat right now. Come out of your seat right now. Come stand here. I want to pray for you. Now listen to what I'm about to say next. The nine gifts that are mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, these are not for only for men. Romans 12 mentions other gifts. Uh, and some of those are specific, but the gifts are not only for men, it's for anyone. And so if you are a, a woman here or a young lady and you want God to use you in that way, I want you to come. I want you to stand behind these men. I want you to say, I'm available for that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to give you some guidance here. Now listen to me. The gifts, the way I can describe it is it's messy business for humans. Because it's people that live, breathe, operate in the natural, trying to step into the supernatural. So it's, it's messy. So I'm going to give you some guidance. Number one is practice the gifts in non-life-changing ways. Here's what I mean by that. Is if you're going to speak in tongues or you're going to interpret don't do it for the first time at conference. Don't be like, I feel it. This is where I'm starting. The context is you develop the gifts in the church, in your local church. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one, the first reason is, is because those people in your church know you. And if you've been in and out and you're, you know, somebody, some guy shows up and he's like, I'm brand new here. I'm going to speak in tongues and prophesy over this church. Is the church can rise up and go, nope, that's, that's not acceptable. We don't even know who you are. The church is to judge the gifts. And so that's why it's supposed to be you develop that in your church. And then after that's developed, you have that gift that operates easily. And you can go to conference in you know, years down the road. But the second reason you're supposed to develop that in the local church is because those people will help you. They'll be gracious with you is sometimes when you step out, you know, a man or a woman, they're going to step out and they're going to interpret. It sounds like something like this. Thus say the Lord, Jesus, God, help us and um, love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. And everybody's like, all right, good try, man. You know, that's the way it should go. <laughs> but your church loves you. So they'll, they'll let you, they'll let you stumble through and develop and, and let you keep trying and, 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 you know, until you get better and you're more comfortable with the voice of God. That's why you develop in your local church. The other thing then is if you're going to be used in word of wisdom and knowledge, your first word to somebody isn't a young man to a young lady. God said, you're supposed to marry me. That's life changing. That's forbidden. So there's a couple ground rules the Bible gives us about these things. Number one, it is always encouragement. It's not directive. If you're going to direct somebody's life, you have to be in the office of a prophet. I know I'm getting a little into the weeds here, but that is not the gift of the word of knowledge and word of wisdom. You're not to direct somebody's life. The words, the gifts are always encouragement. Always encouragement. Whether you're interpreting, you're giving a word of wisdom, knowledge, whatever, it's always to edify, to build up, never to judge or direct. And if you're going to do that, if you're going to go give somebody a word, you have to, in church, bounce that off your pastor. Say, this is what I feel I should tell so-and-so, and then take his advice. If he says, yeah, you're probably right, but maybe timing, wait a minute. Or, yes, okay, go ahead, you can tell them that. Bounce that off your pastor. And then the best way to develop the voice of God, an ear for it, is on outreach. So if you're witnessing to somebody and you feel God telling you they have back pain, ask them, do you have back pain right now? And if they say, nope, never had back pain in my life, then you're going, okay, that wasn't the voice of God. I'll keep working on this. If they say, yeah, actually I injured it at work last week. 
then you go, ding, okay, that's what God sounds like. And all right, so this is helping me. This impression is on. When you're asking questions, nobody's life is changing. If you show up and you go, thus saith the Lord, you hurt your back last week. And they go, no, I did it. Then you're just making yourself and God look, you know, you're giving a bad reputation. Just ask questions. Has something happened in your life recently? Where you, you lost a loved one and it's the voice of God. You can determine that. You're developing. And here's the final thing. I'm going to pray for you, but I have no gift to give you. There's no mantle being passed here. This is what I'm praying for. You would have boldness and faith to step out and do something radical. Tomorrow, tonight, next week, Monday, you're at work. You go to school. You go back to school. You go to your work You're, you're with your family for 4th of July. Use the gifts to win the lost. Witness to people. You see somebody sick? Go lay hands on them. Just see. See what God will do. And God can use your life. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to believe God with me. Father, I pray right now for these men and women that you are going to put your spirit in them. God, fill them with the Holy Ghost and use them in gift ministry. Speak through their life. Win the lost. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. As they pray, God, let there be a dominion for the kingdom of God gained. I thank you for your power. Release it through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God as pastors coming. Oh, God, we're 